Hi everybody, we're here today with uh, Chris Pern, award-winning director and story artist. Um, we're very, very happy to have you here, Chris. Thanks for your time. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, thanks for inviting me. We'll spend some half an hour together to talk about your career and your approach to your job. Um, but before going through the typical list of all your uh, successes and uh, trophies, um, I'd rather have you uh, introduce yourself to, to us. Um, well, I, I, I guess my name's Chris. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Canadian. I was, uh, I've been in, the, in, in animation since about the mid 90s. So, uh, you know, I kind of started out as a drawer. I, I still love to draw and, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to, to, you know, make cartoons and, uh, uh, I'm happy to, uh, happy to be here and chat with you guys. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, throughout your career, um, you went from working solo, uh, to co-directing Cloudy with a chance of meatballs too, and actually directing the Willoughby's. Uh, by yourself, which is now available on Netflix, and I suggest uh, everybody watching this to go and watch it because it's brilliant. Um, this obviously meant for you um, learning to coordinate and to work with a big group of people. Um, right. What's your yeah, tip? Just, Sorry. just to correct something there, I've never done anything by myself in animation. It's, uh, it's such a. There's always like you know, two hundred, three hundred people around you trying to you know, help you lift this thing, yeah. whatever, whatever it is. So <laughs> it's kind of a team sport, isn't what it? You, I mean, what do you do by yourself at the very beginning of your career, everybody's career, is drawing in your room and being a guy that loves drawing. And at the end, you end up working with these huge groups of people. And I wanted to ask you, um, what's your tip for uh, effective, uh, non-psychotic teamwork? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you identified something that's, I think, kind of universal. Like, I think, you know, there's a lot of people in animation and like that population is, is growing every year as, as, you know, people have access to the, to the tools and the schools by which to learn the tools. And, you know, so it's a really big tent operation these days, but it all kind of started for me um, just with a love of drawing and, and, you know, being that quiet person who communicated with cartoons was, like a, a way to kind of fit in when I was growing up. And I think that idea of being the art kid is, is something that kind of drives you towards pursuing, um, you know, the idea of being in film, because at the end of the day, like I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I still just love the idea of entertaining an audience and telling jokes. I always, there's that old saying that an animator is just a, an, an actor who, you know, is afraid to go on stage and uses a pencil <laughs> instead. And I think, I think there's some truth to that. Like, you know, it's like this idea of like, um you know finding that expression of your thoughts and you know um your humanity is is, is something that i think we crave sharing and ironically to learn the craft you're you have to spend a lot of time by yourself and even i think if you are an extrovert like to actually you know get the skills to be a good drafts person or to be a good animator it takes some time alone and 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 so that collides often with how we make these things because at the end of the day if, if it's 24 drawings is one second a film um that's a lot of drawings that need to be created so you need you need a team um and so I, you know when i first started out and we were doing everything on paper like there was this sort of collision of like the instinct to cover up your drawing and make it perfect uh with the reality that the drawings are never going to be perfect and, and, and at the end of the day, it's not about the drawings, it's about the performance. And that was a really big exercise for me in terms of understanding what the collaboration was. Um, you know, kind of like, you know, I guess a football team or a hockey team or a baseball team. It's like one player can't win a game like you need everybody on. One player can make a difference in the game, but like you, 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 you know, you can't you can't win a game without a goalie and you can't win a game without somebody, you know, a goalie can't score all of the goals on the other side. So you just like, it, it's, it's that mentality that is, I think very um, interesting when you, when you start to sort of open up to it. But I, I do think like when you ask the question about like for young people, I think like the main 
the main difficulty I had was getting over my shyness of ideas and, and that I, and, and it's sort of like that collision of like wanting to express ideas while at the same time being afraid of the rejection if people don't like your ideas. And I think as I've gotten older, I'm not, I'm not worried about the rejection as much because I think it's that, that old saying, you know, fail early, fail often, fail cheaply. So if you can just <laughs> like in, in every failure, there's a lesson. And so it's, it, and I think it's whether you're drawing or writing or, um, you know, animating or designing, it's it, that process of sharing ideas with people you trust. If you can get into that scenario where it's like everybody you're working with, you trust it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of words to answer a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, when did you first realize all that uh, sketching and drawing you used to do when you were a kid um, had something to do with uh, what you wanted to do when you were going to grow up? I mean, how does one turn uh, his obsession into a job? You know, I think some of it is luck in my, in my, my case. And I think, you know, I, there's that, like, I think luck is sort of like, um, just having your eyes open when the door is out, when, when, when a door and a window opens to an opportunity, like sometimes that's what luck is. So I think, you know, as, as a kid, like, you know, drawing was a way for me to, again, go back to that word communication. It was, a, it was a way for me to be funny. It was a way to sort of get attention. Um, and, and to, um, I don't know, like, like, fit in I, you know i think there's always that sort of desire as a human to you know sort of comment on the world you're living in or you know be be part of the conversation that's going on and you know growing up as a, as a as a farm kid in ontario canada in the middle of nowhere you know i wasn't good at hockey i wasn't i wasn't um you know, I wasn't the smartest kid at school, but I could, I could tell jokes. And I think the, the, the line in the sand between like being in theater or being, um, you know, a singer or being a, a cartoonist, it's all very similar worlds. It's just like trying to, to observe what you're seeing and poke fun at it. And so I think I went through that experience of, of, of you know, doing that for fun and doing that for, you know, that kind of, um, the, the desire to, you know, be part of the social fabric of my world. And then there's that moment where it's like, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And, and I think I had that journey that a lot of young artists have where it's like, well, should I go into architecture? Should I go into, um, you know, should I quit this and, you know, take a business degree? Like, and, 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 and I was at the edge of doing that when a guidance counselor at my high school told me about Sheridan College. And this was like back in 94, 95. So I didn't even know that animation was a thing. Like we didn't have the internet. I didn't have any art of books. I didn't know what a peg bar was. I didn't know what, um, you know, what it meant to, you know, draw 24 frames for one second. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. And so I went and checked out the college and then I realized that it was an opportunity to sort of, you know, do what I was doing to, you know, communicate with my friends, but actually, you know, make it, move and, and, and like kind of add all that layer of filmmaking. So like the idea of being a filmmaker really started there and I was probably 18 years old. And then I, you know, luckily when I went into college, that was the year that Lion King broke open, all the studios in the state started to expand. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, by the time I graduated, if you could hold a pencil, you could get a job. And then I think that, that was like that moment of luck where it's, you know, I had that time to learn a career you know, and, and to sort of develop those skills. Uh, I couldn't predict where the industry was going to go. I mean, you know, the 2D world collapsed, the, the, the CG studio stood up. And in between there, I was one of those casualties where it's like, you know, you can't predict the future. So I think that that privilege of being in this industry is also always tempered by the knowledge that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's ever changing. And so it's exciting, but it's also like hard to sometimes predict. And I think kind of getting into the industry was, 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 was un, un, I was unable to predict it. So it's like when I'm in the industry and it keeps changing, it kind of feels like the same. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think sometimes it's just being open-minded to the experience when, when, when the opportunity shows itself. And actually I would say it's been some time since 
uh, that first opportunity since then you've been teaching in Sheridan College, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, talking to the kids, it's been a big part of your professional life and your career and always with a special approach, a fresh approach. I mean, uh, your work both as a director and as a story artist is permeated with this uh, dreamlike imagination. Um, to me, it almost feels like you always have a six-year-old kid whispering you absurd pieces of advice in your ear, you know. And I wanted to ask you, how do you keep your um, inner child alive? How do you nurture this imagination? <laughs> it's harder in a pandemic when we're all just <laughs> sitting at home staring at screens. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think yeah. You know, when I was uh, when I was teaching at Sheridan, or like when I um, when I do a lecture or or, or kind of talk to schools, like I, I find I get a lot out of the the kind of um, experience of, of of seeing young filmmakers and and you know, there's there's two sides to what we do. There's the craft, which takes a long time to get good at, and I'm still working on it. And then there's the the kind of just ability to kind of express ideas and and like tell jokes or you know say something meaningful about uh, a subject matter that's close to your heart and i think when you look at you know the diversity of of humans like when i was at sheridan i had students from all over the world and and then i ended up like cut to four years to five years or six years later i'm working with those people and so it, it's it's this idea of like getting the human contact with you know people who are um i don't know just sort of not i hate to use the word jaded but like they're excited about the potential um and and they, and they don't have that sort of weariness of of how much work it is to kind of get an idea up and i i'm i'm guilty of that like i'm you know i'm, I'm in my mid-40s so sometimes the idea of like doing an independent short or a feature is just it makes me tired because i know how much work it is <laughs> and how obsessive we do get on it so it's like i think that's why it's awesome to sort of you know, talk to people who are in a different phase of their experience in their life, um, because it gives you that spark. And as far as that, like inner child voice in the head, like, I don't know, I just I, I think it's, it's awesome to be a human and it's awesome to be alive. And I think there's a lot of funny things in this world. And I think if you can't um, find the humor or like find the, 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 the ability to play, even in the darkest of subject matter, um, it's, uh, it, I don't know any other way to deal with it. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think stand-up comedians often talk about this. It's like, if you don't talk about the darkest thing and the darkest thing will just end up living in your head, like it'll start to chew you up. So it, to me, it's like playing and being silly and like, like not filtering your voice when it, when it like wants to do something absurd. Like that's part of, I think the excitement of being, um, a storyteller. And I could say, um, actually, playing with difficulties, poking fun at difficulties, is also your way of facing difficulties. Um, like in, in your TED talk in Edmonton, uh, you highlighted how failing is a necessary ingredient in your professional life. Yeah. Um, what's uh, the big, let's say, the biggest mistake you made throughout your career, and how would you do things now? Man, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I make a lot of human mistakes, um, you know, in terms of like, sometimes like how you interact with other people. Like, I, like my, my brain goes to like, you know, when I was um, like, like, say, first had a story on, on the first Cloudy movie, I was largely trying to make everybody like me. And I was trying to make everybody happy around, you know, the, the, the department. At the same time, I wasn't I wasn't like filtering my own reaction to things. I was still a story artist and I was, I was kind of punching uphill. So that idea of like, kind of like, like being an artist is one thing. And then being in like a human being interacting with other artists where you're, you're responsible for their emotions. That's a, that's a skill I didn't have very well developed when I was in my late twenties, early thirties. But I, I don't know if I look at those as necessarily even being mistakes. I think those are just human things that we have to learn. And it's like, I think being clumsy in the first time I was running a department made me slightly better 
when I was directing a movie, although I made different mistakes there. I mean, for about a year and a half, I spent a lot of time, I think, treating the job as a director like I was trying to defend every idea. I was afraid to lose an argument, especially with, you know, I think certainly, um, you know, the, the people who were running the studio because I thought I was, you know, there to defend ideas. And really, um, you know, I think in hindsight and, and having good teachers, like I had a great producer, Pam Marsden, who really, I think, and, and, and uh, Miller and Lord, they were great coaches through this process. And I think the idea of like, it's okay to debate a film and my job wasn't always to be right. I needed to learn that. I needed to learn that through the process of going through the, 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 the hard days. And so I think when I did the, the journey of making the Willoughby's, like I was a lot more, um, I think, relaxed in, 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 the, in the conversation around the film because having done it once, you realize, okay, this is not where the idea ends. And, and, and part of my job is to make everybody feel comfortable and heard and they have skin in the game too and it goes back to that idea of collaborating you know what i mean like like i am not doing this movie alone never are and, and, like and that is not um a bad thing you know it's it's it, if i wanted to be singular i would have chosen a different lifestyle a different career and i love playing in the sandbox with a lot of people and so understanding that even your 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 executive that might have a different agenda their agenda is as valid as yours is. And the trick is to try to understand it and get the best version on the screen for the audience. And that serving the audience is something that is not about me. It's not about them. It's not about anybody. And, and, and so like anytime I would get angry, anytime I would lose my temper, I've, I've, I've already lost. And so I think to me, that's the biggest mistakes. If I look back at my past, anytime I got really angry, it was always coming from a place of like, I think true emotion but not understanding how those emotions could, you know, become toxic was, 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 was something that I had to learn. So I don't know, but I wouldn't change anything. I don't, if I, if you gave me a time machine, I don't know if I would go, <laughs> I'd probably go further back to see the dinosaurs. Like I'd, I'd rather go and, or, or like just go to medieval England and with my teeth and see if that would make me attractive, you know? <laughs> um, well, um, I believe, I absolutely agree with what she said. I mean, uh, making some mistakes is uh, is fundamental. It's just ne necessary to to become who we are um, as pro as professional figures and as people in a in a more intimate uh, way. But actually, the movie industry, I guess, because I'm out of it, but I guess is an environment that really does uh, chew you up really if you are not careful with it i mean uh, it's fast paced it's it can be stressful um and you often said like you were born and raised in a goat farm and you now live <laughs> in a different goat farm say um and being uh, i quote out in the wilds is a defining aspect of your life as a creative um, how important is for someone in the industry uh, to find a good uh, work-life balance, or to put it in other word, words, a uh, good uh, Southern Ontario, Los Angeles balance? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think that's, uh, that's um, you know, if you want to be a storyteller, you have to have stories. And so I think part of like being a fully rounded human being is that you have to be able to leave your desk. You have to be able to, you know, you know, have experiences in the world. Now, having said all that, I, I do think one of my one of my struggles still, you know, is work life balance. I, I, I don't I don't always know how to do that. Like, I don't think it's because the amount of commitment it takes to, you know, you know, create an idea, whether it's, you know, drawing a storyboard or animating a sequence or or sitting and edit and trying to figure out how to, you know, make it make an animatic work. It takes time it takes obsessions but but like it's one of those things where i think i don't know if i've gotten better at the blocks as i've gotten older but i have learned that sometimes going for a walk or sometimes when you're really stressed out or you're really kind of struggling with like a, a problem in a, in a filmmaking scenario or what like whether it is the pressure of like the fast pace of hollywood sometimes the best thing to do is sleep 
sometimes the best thing to do is go out into the woods and chop wood or go like, like whatever you like to do. I mean, cook or golf or, um, you know, uh, go tobogganing, walk your dog, like wh whatever, whatever sort of, um, you know, thing gets you out of your head because it's that, it's that ability of like kind of loosening up your limber brain to, so to solve problems. And I'm sure like you've had that experience, like, like w whether it is like being at school and struggling with like, say like, a learning curve on you know physics or um you know if you're if you're trying to figure out how to communicate in a relationship i mean sometimes stepping away is the thing that helps you you know find the empathy or the perspective to get into that better conversation so i i do think that's uh, that's important and i also think it's it's the one thing that i i i don't know if i've talked about too much but Growing up as a kid in the middle of nowhere, I loved TV and I would spend a lot of time watching comedians and like, like being an audience is important when you suddenly, you know, hop over to the other side of that camera. And one of the things I really learned from working with uh, Chris Miller and Phil Lord was that those two guys, as smart as they are, they would actually kind of crash into ideas to make a lot of mistakes to, just to get stuff up on the wall so that they could be an audience like they had that ability to remember what it was like i think to to, to find something funny and because of that like their films and their stories always find that foothold that hook and surprise people because it's it's they're doing it to like they're i think they have that superpower of like being an audience so i mean sometimes like if you just focus on the business of what we do you can get a little cynical and i think you can think about too much marketing and i think sometimes it's really good to just sort of step back and just be a human and so whatever it takes to get there um and i think we live in an industry like what's really cool is like like it was happening before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has really put a, a, a nail in some of the coffins of how we used to do things so like I can work with artists in Spain and Italy and Australia and Japan and China, like all over the world from wherever I am. And so as much as I still miss being in a room with people, it's kind of cool that you get this diverse set of ideas. And because, you know, I'm from where I'm from and you're from where you're from, when we get to a place where we're both laughing at the same joke, I think we've hit something pretty human, you know, and that, that's sort of where it's like, okay, I know this is like my point of view probably is important in telling this joke, but if you're laughing at it and you're from a different part of the world and you have a different childhood and a different, you know I mean? That to me is like, okay, now, now we're on to something that is going to be something's going on. Something's a lot breaking. of other people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's like a real, it's like putting baking soda in water. It starts to bubble. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's why I think it's interesting to, 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 be from where you're from, like have your point of view. But then, you know, when you communicate it out loud, if it doesn't resonate, then you got to pivot, you know? You mentioned uh, stepping back from things. Um, it's something you actually mention quite often. I mean, in the creative process too, sometimes you got to step back, trust the process, let time do the thing. Um, that's uh, like when you say, um, that um, your, your creative process is very similar to uh, tending crops. Um, what do you what do you mean by that? Oh, I think it's like you know you put seeds in the ground and then you have you have to have some degree of faith in in you know that there will be rain that there will be sun and that um, you know whatever the magic is like I can't I can't take like a like a seed and make it grow like I don't I like I could I could you know. I could punch it, I could cut it open, I could <laughs> yell at it, but if it's not gonna grow, because the magic of what a seed needs to grow, um, it's, you know, I, I, can't, I can't change that future. But what I can do is um, when, you know, uh, the, the idea starts to form, like that's where you can be the the steward of that idea like you know you can make sure that the bugs don't eat it you can make sure that um you know you you pick it at the right time do you know what i mean like it, it, I, this metaphor only goes so far and it, it is a very narrow thing but like it does make sense in my in my head I, I i can even pivot like to raising raising kids it's like you know um you you create a life and it's gonna have a brain and it's gonna have its own ideas and if you try to turn it into the thing that you vision 
completely without letting it have its own path, you're just going to end up with a kid that hates you, I think, you know, so you kind of have to allow the 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 process to 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 take you where it wants to go. And I think that actually is that kind of idea of letting go of control and saying yes to the right ideas is something that um, is really like specific to animation. But I think it, it's, it's a, it is something I think across a lot of art forms, you know, it's like if you're a musician and you play in front of a live audience, you're going to feed off that audience. And if you're a comedian and you tell a joke nine times and it only gets laughs two you know, then you got to change the joke, you know, you got to, so it's like our job is to, is to be in the world and sort of like experience it. So just like, you know, you plant a seed and you can't yell at it to grow, you, you can sort of have an idea, pitch a movie and all of the anxiety and frustration and stress isn't going to make that movie happen. What's going to make the movie happen is letting the sunshine on it, you know? I absolutely love uh, the image <laughs> of, uh, yelling at seeds. I, I think I'm going to start yeah. using it as a saying. Um, stop yelling at the seeds. Actually, it's uh, funny because like, some, sometimes when I like, and, and certainly on Willoughby, is like, as I said, like, I feel like anytime I lost my temper, I, I would sort of have that, like, that moment of like, like the next morning was like, oh man, you were yelling at seeds. <laughs> Like, I, I got to stop doing that because uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't help. I need to go get the watering can and give them some love. You know? <laughs> it's, it's incredible how important guidance is in the life of a creative. I mean, um, sometimes you really need somebody to tell you to stop yelling at the seeds. And, yeah. and it's important to have that kind of person uh, with you, working with you, uh, by you. Um, and I think um, last few questions um, about guidance. Um, I was going to ask you about a book, a movie, and a video game that you think every um, high school student should read, watch, and play. Wow, um, that's a big question. Um, see, I don't know. I think it's different for every every person. <laughs> like, I think I like if I would say like a movie, everybody should watch, like I could be intellectual and say, everybody should have seen Chinatown. Um, but if I'm being really honest with you, I think, you know, I think, I think everybody should see a John Candy movie. I think, I think, you know, he's, he's, he's probably of my time, but like when I watch stripes or I watch planes, trains and automobiles, it's like, that's why I do what I do. That's why I want to be where I am. You know, it's like I see that that ability of that human being to just be funny in a way that's heartful, like heart, like like he's such a like I, I just feel so much love when I when I when I watch planes, trains and automobiles. I, I cry at the same moments every time. So I feel like finding that movie for you for for you is important. Um, as far as books go, I mean, I don't know. Everybody should read The Hobbit. I think that I think it's probably, you know, for me, it was one of those stories that just it made me want to be in the world of the what if. And uh, at the same time, I think even as a young kid, I understood that they were that you know, Tolkien was talking about something bigger than just uh, elves and, and hairy footed hobbits. So I think I think that kind of storytelling is really important. Um, and as far as I'm not a video gamer, so, you know, I, I kind of. Uh, I kind of don't know if I have a good answer in that one. I grew up playing a lot of uh, Blades of Steel, which is just like, you know, um, video game hockey. So I think, I don't know. Now I play online Scrabble. Maybe that's my game because it's like keeps, keeps your brain active. <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually, I, sorry, to, I'm, this is not my experience, but like my daughters like grew up with Minecraft, as I'm sure you guys did um, as well. And I think there was something really, I think, mind blowing to me watching them experience that collective thing of like building worlds with other people and i think i don't know that's really cool and i and i do think you know where filmmaking is heading is is probably hard to predict but that interactive sort of creative like like spirit is is that gives me a lot of hope you know because there's a lot of stuff that is you know straight up entertainment but that one the way they would get their brains going was pretty cool um, so is that a, is that an okay answer it's, it's a super okay answer. Actually, I'm 22, and in the last lockdown, uh, you could find me and three of my 22-year-old friends playing Minecraft with my sister 
was 14 yeah. and her friends. And it was actually pretty beautiful if you think about it. And it's nice. Yeah, that's all, like my daughter's 20 and, and, and her cousins are like kind of around the like 14 down to like, I think eight and they all play Minecraft. Like it's, how did you like when you were doing it? Like, did you like, did you feel like a kid again? Like, absolutely. But in, in, I mean, uh, in, it was what we were looking for. We were going through the first lockdown and that's really what we needed. And it was beautiful to find it and to have it as a shared experience. So it's a little miracle, isn't it? Um, yeah, and you're kind of you're kind of building something, even if it's not real. It's this idea of like making something, you know, in while well, outside the world feels really scary. You know, I think that's that. That's what I think is the engine of creativity of the life of a lot of us creatives, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you could, last question, very last one. If you could talk to a teenage version of Chris Pern, what is the single best advice you could give the kid? I'd say don't be afraid, you know? Um, it's, I mean, fear is good because it, it does motivate you to succeed or, you know, gives ambition. But, you know, so many times I was, I was like self-censoring and, um, you know, or I would think the world was ending when it, it wasn't. And I think, you know, maybe that is hindsight. And if I had a tell, told it to myself at the age of 18, I don't know if I would have listened. <laughs> but like, uh, I don't know, I think, I think, I think the idea of, um, it's going to sound cheesy, but the idea of, of taking a risk and doing, doing the, the dangerous thing, even though it might not always feel like the safe thing is, uh, is, um, I've never regretted that. You know, I've never regretted that, even if things didn't always like move down to the States in the mid 90s. And I picked the wrong studio if I was looking at kind of building a career at one place, you know, Fox uh, shut down the 2D thing. And I, I had ju I just had a kid and I thought, wow, the world is the world is uh, is falling apart. And I didn't I didn't I didn't feel like um, I'd made the right decisions. But now that I look back on my career is like those were all the right decisions. And like every time, you know you 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 leapt because it felt right in the gut was even if it didn't always end up being the right outcome or the best results it was the right decision i think that's something i would tell myself is just listen to that voice and that was and it. keep drawing and keep drawing <laughs> that's important well um thank you what else can i say thank you chris thank you very much well, thank it's you a super nice uh, half an hour um, uh, everybody go check out the Willoughby's on Netflix, I'll repeat this, um, and I also want to thank uh, Maria Elena Gutierrez and VIEW Conference, uh, they made this interview possible, uh, thanks to OGR, Officina Grandi Riparazioni, that is hosting us, and it's the place where we are right now, and again, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you oh. very much, and, and oh, I hope you have a... Hope we'll meet in person next year at VIEW Conference and hope you have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Good luck with everything, eh? Thank you. You too. Bye.